Welcome, uh, I'm Christopher Bamford, Steiner Books. This is my friend, colleague and author, John McAllis. And we are discussing the basic books of Rudolf Steiner. In this case, the philosophy of freedom. Uh, last time, this is the second of our discussions. Uh, and last time we introduced some of the uh, uh, shades of meaning in the book. And this time, which will be our final discussion on the philosophy of freedom, we're going to try to unravel the basic question of what Rudolf Steiner means by freedom. Thinking about it this morning, it seemed to me that it's easy to see that we're not free. As Rousseau at the end, early 18th century, already noted uh, human beings are born free but are everywhere in chains. Today we might say human beings are born to be free but are everywhere in chains. That's to say that generally speaking, our thoughts, feelings, actions, and desires are always shaped by our past experiences, our past thoughts, our past judgments, our prejudices, cultural prejudices, our passions, our desires, and so on. And within these, we actually live as in a cage, which we believe to be the real world, uh, and which we will defend at all costs, which is called egotism. But at some level, deep level, where, we might ask ourselves later, we know that this is not the real world. And to be convinced of this, we only need to look at the consequences. It can't be the real world if we look at the mayhem we create around us. So we want to be free. Blessedly we know, but again the question is, who in us knows? We ought to be free. Selfless, loving, that freedom would enable us to begin to make life anew, to live into the future, and that we feel trapped by our unfreedom our isolation, our loneliness, our lack of real immediate connection with the world and with one another. So to this quandary, in a certain sense, uh, was working his way out of this quandary that Rudolf Steiner wrote The Philosophy of Freedom. And by following his uh, path, as he puts it, up the mountain. He says there are other paths, but this is the path that he took. We too perhaps can find a way out. Uh, we said last week that this is a difficult book to grasp. Uh, and so what we want to do today is present some ideas around the idea of freedom that will help readers get into it. And in fact, since everything hinges on this idea of freedom, uh, we're really going to focus on, as I said, what Rudolf Steiner means by freedom. One well, clue is given when we realize that Philosophie der Freiheit, in German, philosophy of freedom, when it was first to be translated into English, Rudolf Steiner suggested that that title wouldn't work for the English speakers. Uh, they already had a different relationship to freedom than the Germans and that we should call it in English the philosophy of spiritual activity. And with this, of course, he suggests that freedom is an activity, a spiritual activity, not a state or condition. And in the book, you'll find, we find, that he often characterizes uh, this activity simply as thinking. He'll say that we are free in our thinking, but then as we enter deep, more deeply into the book, we find that this is not our ordinary thinking, but what he calls pure thinking, which we might also call receptive thinking, perhaps. And then we learn further that this thinking has to be willed. And, but then on the other side, we learn that <laughs> willing is not free in itself, but only if impelled by a thought. In other words, Willing and thinking are in a circular relationship with each other somehow. 
that he is, he quotes, as in the book, he says, freedom lives in thinking. The will is not directly free. What is free is the thought that energizes the will. So we have this uh, knot of willing and thinking. But then we learn that feeling too is involved. But once again, it's only feeling that becomes permeated with thinking. And finally, we learn that love or devotion to the world or devotion to the future is necessary. So that in this uh, activity of thinking, somehow in a... uh, Not a knot, but what would you say? In a... uh, in a deep interconnection with each other. We have thinking, willing, feeling, and love. Uh, which is to say that, in essence, freedom is an activity of our whole being. And then on top of this, there's the critical question of who's thinking or the I. Uh, for it's for the I bobs in and out of the philosophy of freedom. And perhaps uh, the I, the higher self, or the true I, rather than the egotistic lower self, uh, is that which becomes, is the agent and is imminent and becomes manifest in this freedom. So that's it for today, and we'll try to, my introduction, we'll try to untangle this. And so, John, where would you begin? I think I'd begin with the, uh, the question, what does Steiner mean by freedom? Because there are lots of different qualities or experiences of freedom. Right. When you think of, uh, you know, skiing on an, un, on an unbroken expanse of snow with a clear sky overhead and nobody around, and you can just swoop down. That's also an experience of freedom. Mm-hmm. Um, there are experiences of freedom, for instance, we'll have an experience of freedom when this is over, right. and we can just go out, and we'll be free of it. Um, we have a f- sense of freedom while it's going on, so we don't know what's going to happen next. <laughs> this is also true, because there's nobody that sort of says it has to go this way. Right. Um, but so the freedom is a very, uh, I would say, a very co- complex concept or notion. Uh, and Steiner, does, Steiner focuses us on a certain experience of freedom. It's a little like the experience that, um, you know, this Thomas Merton, I can't remember exactly where he was, but he comes into, this, he comes into a conversation with one of the uh, Buddhist monks in Delhi and asks him, what's the idea of freedom? Right. And the monk answers him, um, well, now you're in Delhi. Before you only thought about being in Delhi. You have to take all the steps, go the whole path, and then you have to take the leap. The experience of the leap is the knowledge of freedom. Huh. Which is, um, you know, there's a wonderful quality in that, that freedom is never something that exists as an absolute outside of ourselves. It's a very specific quality of experience. And this quality of experience is the one that Steiner focuses on in this book. What is the experience of freedom, not being free from something or being let free, but the quality, the experience of freedom when I know I am giving myself freely in this moment to this situation. I am acting out of a situative, momentary, totally free giving. Right. 
That's the quality. He says, in that moment, that's when you actually begin to experience what it means to be a self. This is the experience of the self in the world, your own self. You're not acting out of any kind of external... Um, so freedom is, in this sense, is actually being present. It has to do with being present in now. And, and yeah. when, you, when you said, uh, Martin, he said to Merton, well, now you're in, in Delhi. Mm -hmm. I thought of that very early piece in a letter that Steiner writes about uh, Schelling and Schelling saying that there's a that it's possible to be outside space and time in the absolute now. And Steiner writes to his friend that he spent all night trying to do this, and he achieved it. Yeah. And so that right. would be an experience of freedom. Right. But then on the other hand, the, the quote that came through my mind was he when speaking of meditation, he always says that the the decision to meditate is the only truly free act. Yeah. And in that sense, he means that partly um, there's no reason to do it. Uh, it's, uh, you can't do it really for any purpose. You just do it just so. Right. Uh, or how does he mean it when he says that to meditate is the only truly free act? Well, there's no necessity. There are no forces of necessity right. driving the decision to meditate. It's something that arises only out of a sense of one's loyalty or faithfulness to the experience of the evolving self, the emergent self. And right. there I meditate in order to, you know, cultivate or nurture this emergent being. Right. Because if you, because you, it, it, I mean, all traditions are very clear that there's no point in spiritual practice that is purposive. Right, yeah, exactly. You, you don't pray in order for something to happen. Yeah. Or you don't sit in order. Uh, you know, the Japanese, great Japanese philosopher Dogen will say, just sitting is already enlightenment. Yeah. Just doing it, that's all. Yeah. There's nowhere to go. But on the other hand, uh, How do you get there? How does the ordinary person get to make such a free decision? Right, and that's usually that, we, we're, we're empowered by some purpose. We're empowered we're yeah. by some rationalized purpose. Yeah. I mean, that's the question that Steiner struggles with throughout the book, and he shows a certain path that that hangs on these two experiences, these two core experiences. You know, the, the spiritual presence of the self in thinking and the spiritual presence of the self in the world through an action born out of a conceptual intuition. So the two of them, they're two experiences. And that's, it, I think one of the reasons this book is so difficult for many people is that it's, it's thought but not experienced. If you don't come to the first experience, the experience of the self in thinking, it's very difficult to come to the second experience. And then you can get into this sort of endless discussion of what does Steiner mean by concept? What does he mean by percept? What does he mean by mental image? What does he mean by thinking? Um, how does it relate to this philosopher or that philosopher? But for Steiner, that was secondary. I mean, he describes the path, but at the, at the center of it are these two experiences. And if you don't experience them, the book is very difficult. And it's easy to just set aside. Yeah, but there isn't there a third experience that is very critical in Steiner's, in the way he lays it out? Namely, so that working with thinking, in the process of working with thinking, as he suggests, and uh, uh, approaching what he calls pure thinking, at some point 
you recognize that thinking is a cosmic or supra personal process. Because yeah. right. you'll say, with my thinking, I have a corner of the world process. Yeah. And that experience uh, came to him quite early, although in the because he it comes into you know he puts it forward in the book, uh, just as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. But that experience, that uh, what he calls thinking, is um, a world or cosmic or creative. It's the creative reality of the world. Right. So that it's not thinking. it's not it's not my thinking or the brain thinking, it's thinking. It's thinking, it has that, As, that uh, which, it has that cosmic quality. You could say the content and the relationships between the concepts yeah. are embedded in an, with an immediacy in the reality of what lives in the cosmos as activity. Yeah. However, it wouldn't be there if I didn't think. For my consciousness. All right. So it has the two sides. It has this universal quality, and yet it couldn't be manifest, it couldn't be grasped or grappled with if I didn't think. So right. in a certain sense, I do think. Oh, yes, you do think. But, but, but at some point, this larger experience has to occur, right. for, uh, which in a way is the true germination point. Of the seed you were talking about. Yeah. yeah. Well, Steiner, I mean, a little later, Steiner does um, he describes the knot. Right. We go back to your knot not, a little bit. Just here. This is this is 1920. Um, the philosophy of freedom has just gone into a second edition. And he writes, uh, in a, or he speaks in a lecture, just as we attained freedom by permeating the, light, the life of thought with will, so do we attain love by permeating the life of will with thoughts. Right. We unfold love in our actions by letting thoughts permeate into the realm of the will we develop freedom in our thinking by letting what is of the nature of will radiate into our thoughts. And because we are a unified whole, when we reach the point where we find freedom in the life of thought and love in the life of will, there will be freedom in our actions and love in our thinking. Right. Isn't that fantastic? It's a wonderful um, quote. And, and you, you can see how he, he weaves the two of them back and forth. It's not just freedom in the realm of thinking, love in the realm of will, but it's, it's each and each one of them. It's each and each, each one, one right. right. So that you can't, in a certain sense, take them apart. Um, as your freedom is only achieved when permeated with love, and love is only achieved when permeated with the forces of freedom. Right. Uh, and by love, and love being this uh, love of the world, essentially. Love, well, I, I, yeah. I wouldn't even limit it. I think love as an experience that transcends my experience of separation. Why don't we take those? And try to unravel each one of them because he, this relationship between thinking and willing, that w the thinking has to be permeated with will. But the fact that he says will is not free in itself, so that the uh, thinking or a particular thing thought has to be placed into the will so that the will can then enter into the thinking, right? Through, with, by, by the thought or by thinking. Uh, yeah. 
Um, I mean, you have different, don't you have different levels of it? Yeah, I'm sure. So that you have, for instance, um, you may decide to have a cup of coffee. Right. And then the picture or the, the idea, the notion, uh, I'm going to get a cup of coffee. Right. That takes hold of your will and carries you down the street to the coffee shop. Right. The thought of the cup of coffee that you're going to have takes hold of the will and carries you down there. But that wanting the cup of coffee is something completely focused on myself. Now suppose you grab... So that it's actually a feeling. No, so I mean, that's I it's the like mental, it. no, it's the picture of the, the pleasure picture. I'm going to have, of the feeling of pleasure I'm going to have when I hold that cup of coffee in my hand and lift right. it to my uh, mouth. Or the feeling, you could say, can also be something completely different, that you have a child, um, and you know that this child loves little drawings of gnomes right. looking out of bushes. And you can say, okay, the feeling of pleasure that the child is going to have when she gets this card of this little gnome looking out of the bushes is what illuminates my actions. It takes hold of my will and I get out my pencils, I get out the paper and I start to draw and create this little card. But it's that sense of, now you're already in the sense of another person's feeling of pleasure. Right. The thought but, has changed. But also in there is, uh, the, b both these examples have this uh, future orientation. Mm -hmm. Well, I think... So the, and that, that future orientation comes from thinking or from the willing? From the will. It's already there in the thought, in the way you described it. Right, it's the, well, so I mean, the okay. way Steiner describes it, it's the mental image of the joy, of the feeling of pleasure that you will have, or right. the feeling of accomplishment, or the feeling of that actually motive, that takes a thought, lets a thought take hold of the will and get you to somewhere. These are, are they're just a complicated examples because both of these are um, self-oriented. They're desires. I mean, at the, the the coffee well, you want a cup of coffee you, is a is a is a desire of of your little self. Right. Exactly. So but we're talking about this not of willing and uh, uh, thinking, or this interpenetration of willing and thinking, out of a, 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 a condition of, of greater purity, where desire and all those things don't any longer play a part. No? I think Steiner starts really with where we are. And, we, and you can continue to... I mean, you can continue to evolve the quality of what your thoughts can grasp. I mean, you could say the coffee is focused completely on me. The card is focused on the child. Right. Um, I can also grasp further and take the situation, for instance, in Syria at the moment um, and become really conceptually uh, involved with the unfolding of this, you know, this completely inhuman drama of this civil war and the moral unwillingness of anyone to help or interfere or resolve it. And now I'm in a in a, uh, now I become involved in something that is much larger than the self that wishes for the cup of coffee. Oh yeah, well, it's also quite different. 
because the, once you bring Syria up, you're in the arena of what Rostana calls uh, moral intuition. Because you know we're in a we're in a, an event. Yeah. Through the media, I mean, through hearing about it, right. when uh, these tragedies, horrific events, suffering of millions of people are taking place. We are witnessing them. Mm -hmm. uh, we either close that out and pretend it doesn't exist, or we have to find some response. Otherwise, we simply open ourselves to just deeper and deeper being traumatized more and more deeply. So the, but the response would come through an act of moral intuition, even in that case. Absolutely, there's nothing, there's no, there's no, you could say at that point, at this moment in time, there are no principles that tell us how to behave in this situation. The only thing that's going to change it is the individual action of someone placing himself or herself freely in relation to and acting out of this freedom. You could say it has to do in many ways with every situation we're experiencing at the moment. You know, global warming. We know right. everything we need to know about global warming. There's an incredible amount of literature. We know what we should do, mm -hmm. but do we do it? Do we do it? And this question of how does the idea, the idea of what needs to, you know, of what we could understand in the situation, how does that idea actually transform into individual action? That's the that's right. the question that runs through the middle of, through the the thread that runs through this book. Yeah, nobody's going to tell you what that's to that's do. the thread of the last section, which is actually the larger right. section. Yeah, I mean the first section deals with um, the thinking and the willing and the feeling and so on in this knot, and then the larger second section deals with uh, really activity in the world. See, it's, it's absolutely clear you cannot, I, I don't know, maybe we shouldn't go there, but... <laughs> <laughs> We've already gone. <laughs> well, if we go there, but you, if you take it seriously and you think it through, we cannot, if we take this, the challenges and the situations and the events in the world today seriously, we cannot continue to live the way we do right. because our very living is the cause of many of these situations but how do you find how do you find the courage the will the spark that lets you change where does that come from and it's very clear that's not going to come from outside right it's only going to come through the choice of an individual, a concrete, um, evolving human individual. So, which is really the how it's going to come from grasping and being able to put into practice the first half of the book. And I always read, always saw that as um, implicitly uh, speaking. Of, a, of an actual spiritual path of, of, a, of a meditative type and, and uh, drawing on uh, his experiences uh, working through Goethe and his uh, experiences with Felix Kogushki, the mm -hmm. herb gatherer with nature and the way in which uh, through the, the ex activity of pure thinking in relation to um, percepts, mental pictures, content present in the, in the natural world, in this case, 
uh, he experienced this, the uh, uh, touching into world creative process. And, and, so, uh, under, and so came to understand the, um, this um, human uh, birthright to be a free participant in this mm. process. Yeah. So he really, he, I mean, so, so, uh, yeah. overcoming completely the notion that the human being is doomed to be a spectator of cosmic events. Right, as he would later say, the human being is a uh, co-worker with yeah. the Christ. Right. But it's but you don't need to use those words. It's implicit in. Uh, the capacities of uh, uh, um, reintegrating, uh, you'd have to say, uh, human consciousness and world consciousness in such a way that, uh, well, he, this is the word he would use, probably, uh, processes of redemption occur. Or that, the, and that, that this the is deed, a free deed. These right, are free. That, that the free deed is a um, deciding factor in the ongoing unfolding of the cosmos. Yeah, which is preceded by the becoming free. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's an int, it's it's a, it is a lo, this is a path one wa wa walks from unfreedom gradually into becoming free. Right. Or approaching. But do you ever, I mean, I think, I think one of the things that upset Steiner most about Kant was not actually the, um, you know, not the thing in itself and the, the, um, the, you know, the reason, but the fact that, that Kant placed human morality on a level of generalization. He generalized right. the autonomous human being into a law, a lawfulness. This is the human being. And in doing it, he lost the specific, concrete, evolving, emerging human individual. Wow, and he nixed freedom. And in doing it, he nixed freedom, right? right? So even his concept of freedom, because it's generalized, is empty. It has no but meaning. Yeah, they're related, though. The the the, um, the Ding an sich and the limits to knowledge is related to the generalized uh, exactly. legal uh, su submission right. to morality. Yeah. Because uh, what he constructs in his philosophy is this cage right. of uh, of. Uh, of our own forms of knowing, outside of which there you can't get, right. and this is has to be. This is you know his Prussian. This is lawful, <laughs> and so you're stuck in it. And what Steiner's experience? Not only didn't he like that uh, Kant, you know, set limits to knowledge, and said the Dingan sich ah, you'll never know this, but Steiner's own experience in this sense of becoming free and, beco and entering and, uh, uh, and um, uh, entering w or, or, or uh, entering that thinking which is continuous with world thinking. Once, once he had that experience or intuition, clearly there were no limits. It would be a continuous process of becoming in knowing uh, indefinitely, infinitely, actually. Right, when you grasp thinking as an organ of intuition, uh, right. or the perception of intuition. Right. There are no limits to it. But human individuality doesn't exist anywhere else except in each evolving human individual. You can't find a generalized 
notion of human individuality. It's not and I think it's the same with freedom. You can't find a general, you can't even make a general statement that the human being is free or not free. Right. Because it's the experience or the way I place myself in the unfolding of an event or a situation that either allows freedom to be present or not. Right, well, clearly the uh, I is not a thing. Uh, and that human individuality, as um, humanity, uh, Urosai would call the human, humanity the tenth hierarchy. Mm. Uh, so that in a sense, as individualities, we are like the angels, for instance, who only exist in their activity. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, the, old, the old angelologies, it was uh, angels only um, manifested when they did something, in action. They're only actions. Mm -hmm. They're not uh, just hanging around. Well, it's right, all, so you'd have to use so human the, being, being as being. Being, right. right. Uh, and the human individuality, the true individuality, is also pure activity. The I is pure activity. It's not... Uh, um, and in that sense, it's virtually synonymous with uh, freedom and love, right? Because that, that's what that activity in which it manifests is. It has, it's, it's, it, it. Right, and, if you, and yet, if you look at it closely, I'm going to say, yeah, if you observe the act closely, that you may place yourself in a situation freely, but in the moment you begin to act, you give up your freedom. Freedom is never anything you can have. It's only something you can give. You can give and receive then too. You can receive right the blessings of an act of freedom. Well, uh, but you can never the, have it. Right, and uh, that's to say that freedom is and the I are always only in the present. Mm -hmm. And if you see this uh, being as receptive, in the present, we receive and give. You give what you receive. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, the only, that's what you do with gifts. True gifts are always given immediately back, away. They're They're given gi further, yeah. given They're further. Given further. But it's also, isn't it that way with every deed that you may experience, I mean, the, the experience of freedom comes out of an understanding of what is needed. But when you act, you place yourself within the constraints of what the situation demands. Right. Oh, what, what intuition tells you the situation demands. Exactly, right. Well, so bring us down to earth then. Well, that's pretty earthly. That's pretty earthy, and particularly I was thinking of the where in talking about moral intuition and you know the way uh, one is in the event, one sizes up, one intuitive concepts comes in, and one act. He then says something to the effect that, and if it turns out that the uh, if those intuitions were were wrong, you just carry on. Right. So there's no, I mean, in the, in the philosophy of freedom, anyway, and uh, it's the, there's an uh, ambiguity about intuition in that sense. In no, that, no, no, I, I, I love this. Right, that um, every intuition is not necessarily true. That, uh, Wittgenstein right. said, uh, mm. the fact that our intuitions are not always correct, is this not the origin of the idea of the devil? Mm. So, Wittgenstein was a very clever man. He was. Yeah. But where does so, <laughs> but the, so, yeah, but so intuitions are not always correct. Right. Well, you could say that so, but an intuition is never, the intuition allows me to grasp 
a concept, but never in the completeness of the conceptual expanse. Right. So I can only grasp that aspect of it for which I am ready. It can always grow. They are never complete. And that thus, right. I may be off the mark. But right. that, has, that, doesn't, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Well, but, uh, but it also in terms of uh, Rudolf Steiner spiritual research, which grows out of these experiences described mm. in, uh, in the philosophy of freedom, uh, often he will, res will speak of having researched a particular um, reality you know, for 50, 10 years, mm. for, for a long time. And in that process, you can, I mean, he's repeating his um, meditation reception on this t question. And intuitions will come, but the, he, will, he holds it long enough till the, they, uh, till they're, if they're off, they're corrected, right? Right. He let, yeah. He does. He works to. He doesn't really. Sp he doesn't talk about things immediately when he discovers no, them. No. No. He he cultivates them and nurtures them and lets this process through which the concepts begin to clarify. Right. Themselves. It's very interesting because I think it's what is I think it's in relation to something to do with the Grail that he speaks of how he'd been working with this question. For the last ten years, yeah. and he sort of thought he had it, but there was a piece missing. Mm. And then this, this piece came in, and actually, it showed that everything that he, the way he'd set it, the intuitions lived together before, was all wrong, <laughs> and the whole thing changed. Yeah, it's a little. So I it's mean, a, in it's a different it's realm, a, it's the, his his research into the human senses, the sense. Right. You know, what do we, how do we sense, what do we actually sense? And that evolved. I mean, it, it begins with certain descriptions, and these descriptions evolve over time, which is, I think, a very important thing to recognize in relation to Steiner's work, is that it has this emergent quality. What he says in 1920, 1925, has a different quality than what he's saying in 1894, and yet it's present in seed right. in 1894 and unfolds as it goes on. Um, he does only one further edition of the philosophy of freedom. 1918. 1918, in which he's, he doesn't, he basically doesn't change the text. He just adds a bit to it. In his own words, he says, well, all I did was, it was a, you know, clarify. He does a copy edit. Thought. He does a copy edit because they have the, the yeah. addition, you know, he, he changed something, two or three things on every page, but just odd words. Right, where he thought he, express, he expressed himself clumsily. Clumsily, yeah, right, exactly. right. But he doesn't change the content. No. He doesn't change the the basic structure or the, you know, the thread of thought that goes through it in any way at all. Because it's actually, it's a, a kind of a guide, but it's a guide to finding one's own way. Mm -hmm. There is a story, and I'm not sure it's true, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Yeah. There's a story that in well, one, of the, fiction, one of the, the first printing, yeah. um, it was, there was a misprint, and he came back with there were a printed side and a blank side, right. and a printed side and a blank right. side. And Steiner said, ah, great. <laughs> Everyone can write his own philosophy of freedom mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on the blank pages. Yeah. But it, I think this is an, um, it's important that um, Even this path of freedom and intuition is always a path of becoming, and uh, uh, there's nothing absolute about it. it right. It's it, it, it's um, it's 
in a sense, uh, the kind of um, thinking he's talking about is really um, thinking becomes a kind of organ of perception. Of, mm. and um, and in that sense, it's uh, privy to the um, same problems <laughs> that all perception is. What are those problems? Well, that you're not always uh, you don't always see what's there. You don't always get it right. You see it, but you don't. Yeah. Is that, and that we yeah. got. Is that a problem of perception or conception? Uh, conception, which in, in in this instance is like the intuition you would yeah. carry away. I think that's true. Uh, so you, you really have to stay with these, work with them meditatively to, uh, in a way to um, test them. And then I was thinking that that is in a sense one aspect that I hadn't thought of before of why he calls it spiritual science. Because it has to be, it requires this uh, experimental method. But it's of, yeah. yeah, the testing. The, uh, you know, this, the Gandhi, Gandhi's autobiography is uh, the story of his experiments with truth. Mm -hmm. It's, about, it's a, similar to what goes through this book. And Steiner describes his experiments with truth. Actually, that's a very. It's actually also we could call this book experiments with freedom. I mean, is it? That's that's. I haven't seen that noted before. Actually, but that's very good. Yes, yeah. it is a series of experiments that are re recounted chapter by chapter and within the chapters. Right. But now, so you have to say, Chris, why in the world would anyone want to read this book? I mean, it's not easy reading. It's a hundred years, it's over, you know, it's well, over it's a hundred, hundred years, years old. old. Well, it was written, it's a hundred and twenty, hundred, was written in, uh, started around 1890, so that, that would make it uh, 110, 120, close to 125 years. And yet he said that this was the, when all, they, someone asked him, well, which of your books is going to last longest? He said, well, the only, in, in the future, this one will be the only one that's still read. And that's because, um, for all its difficulties, which you could say are its faults in a certain sense. Its it faults? Fault, yeah. I mean, it was the only way he could do it. It was amazing he was able to do it, but it uh, it it is uh, it's 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 a difficult book. Nevertheless, it's the only. Um, it remains unique for all the advances that philosophy has taken through the twentieth century. It remains unique in its uh, in the understanding of these things that we've been talking about, namely the relationship between thinking, well becoming, will, feeling, and service to the world in the knot of freedom, or all none of which is. Possible without this act, this activity, right. yeah. we're calling freedom, and no one else has done that. I mean, it's uh, it has a um, you know Martin Heidegger has his book Was heißt Denken, and there's a lot of you know, and there are certain definitely certain. Uh, uh, Resonances between what Heidegger means by Denken, Duncan, so on, mm -hmm. and Rothstein, but it remains at a at a at a poetic level, as it were. Whereas Rudolf Steiner's account is uh, very concrete, even though you have to you have 
trouble unraveling what really he means by percepts, concepts, mental pictures, and all that. These are very concrete things he's talking mm. about. And what makes it difficult is that he alludes, sometimes does tell you, but mostly he alludes to what he means by these things. So you have to work it out. It's right. not a book that reads itself. I know. It does not. Whereas some of his other books, you know, you can read. Like they, are, they, are, they may be steep thinking, but they. But this one, really, you have to unravel. I think. Right, and but it's, it's 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 the only. It really is the. It's a turning point thing, turning point book. I mean, what he does in this book is something that no other philosophy philosopher at his time anyway had dared and he describes thinking and action from the inside out rather than standing outside of it outside of human consciousness and defining and characterizing and uh, categorizing different aspects Steiner delves in, dives in, and from within describes the experiences and the processes. Mm -hmm. it's, we call it about soul observation. It's soul, a, a, soul observation according to the modern scientific method. Right. So he's turning a clear gaze inward and f observing the life, this inner life of the self in relation to the world and describing it as he goes. Right. I mean, the key there is in relation to the world. Right. Absolutely. Because the German uh, so-called idealist philosophers, uh, Kant, Fichte, and Schelling, and uh, Hegel, Hegel. Uh, did a kind of phenomenology from inside, but they left the world mm -hmm. the outside out. Right. Uh, Schelling brought had the world in a different way, and uh, the Novalis and the early Romantic Jena did too. But they 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 had this, but it was. Uh, It it didn't um, it didn't grant the world autonomy, or didn't grant the world its that this is the real context of human and spiritual activity is the cosmos. That's why co cosmology is so important in Steiner too, and so it's placed within this within the world. I think that's. As much as going inward, it's also going outward. Right, exactly. And, I mean, but they're the same. But they're the same. But he holds those two together. And in fact, they're, by calling it monism, he's really saying it's the, the same. It's one. Whether you go when going out or in, it's one. It's not. It's not. Uh, or it's not one, not two. Right. <laughs> <laughs> to coin a modern phrase. Right. I think that's what's... Uh, and what is also, uh, you know, it's, uh, we get sentimental, but it, what is also unique throughout Steiner's work and already here is actually the primacy of love. Primacy of devotion to the world. Yeah. The primacy of service to the world. Mm -hmm. Because by the time you get to the uh, last chapters, that's really the function of the whole, what he's been doing. I mean, the, that's really uh, where it becomes redemptive. And in the, you know, in one's own experience, it... Um, it can be gratified. I mean, it, it's it, but it's not till you're free, acting freely in the world, 
and that in becomes the moment. in the moment, and that becomes more and more um, to the front as anthroposophy de- develops after the First World War. So, uh, and, then, and it's not the, that he uh, gives up then. Uh, with you know, they say, well, you know, in the beginning he thought everybody has capacities, as he says at the beginning of uh, how to know, and uh, people just practice; they'll be able to do it. It's not that he gives up that they, they were, that was wrong. It's that it really doesn't work until you take that other up. Oh, there are some people who say philosophy of freedom is one path, and how to know higher worlds is another. I would say they're the same path. Or you could say maybe they are two sides of the same path. Just two expressions of two the one expressions path. Two of the expressions one path. of the one path, right. Right. But this book, I mean, One's many in people... One's poetry and in prose. Steiner <laughs> said theosophy was the other approach. But it doesn't matter. But in a certain <laughs> sense, many people deal with this book as though it were a philosophical treatise. And there are great, there's a great deal of very clever, I'm going to say, argumentation around the way Steiner unfolds freedom in thinking. Yeah. But it seems that the book is much more a book that leads that where the freedom only becomes a reality when it enters into action. Right. So that the thinking on and for itself has also the tendency to lead into abstraction. It's only when the intuition is placed back into relation to the world that this quality of freedom arises. That you can't separate the two. Right. You can't separate the will and thinking. If the thought does not, what if it? If you can't learn to love the thought enough that it leads you to act on it, it has it can play no role in birthing the experience of freedom. Right. I mean, it's not no. As, as a, um, it's. It's not, a, it's not a work of philosophy as philosophers understand it. Right. I was thinking as you were talking that really it's a work of spiritual autobiography. Yeah. And that's... I mean, and that, and, and you know, taken as such, and that one person's experience can be another if one does it, that's probably a good way to take it. Good. Well done. Thank you.